On the 24th of August, 410 CE, Rome fell to the Goths, led by King Alaric, and the city was sacked for the first time in 800 years. So who was to blame for this disaster, the pagans or the Christians? Well, the pagans of the time blamed the rise of Christianity and the abandonment of the Greco-Roman gods and traditional pagan culture and philosophy. And it was these accusations that led to St. Augustine, the late Roman period bishop and Christian polemicist and arguably the greatest influencer in early Christianity to write his most well-known work, City of God Against the Pagans. The object of the book was to answer the various questions being posed by the pagans in those uncertain times. But in fact, the fall of Rome raised just as many, if not more, questions from the Christian perspective as well and meant many Christians wavering in their beliefs. So let's take a look at a a few of these issues. Well, firstly, why had the Christian God failed to stop the fall of the city now that it was largely Christian? Or had he actually pushed this huge calamity on the empire himself? Surely keeping this Christian empire as dynamic as possible served its purpose, far more than any work done by the Christian apostles or missionaries and martyrs of previous centuries. Secondly, why had the Roman Empire been stronger and more dynamic during the pagan period and actually weaker and declining after it became Christian? Surely the Christian God would have engineered it the other way. It seemed to make no sense. Then there was the issue of miracles. Miracles and supernatural intervention were commonplace in Christian mythology. So why does God intervene in far less important circumstances? For instance, in the case of one or another apostle or martyr, but fail to save thousands of his followers from being killed or their livelihoods destroyed during the capture of the city. The Old Testament, the Gospels and the the hagiographies and stories of the various saints and martyrs are full of divine help or miracles of some sort or another to one individual or another. A miracle preventing the Goths laying siege to and then entering the city would have saved hundreds of thousands of Rome's population from misery, starvation and loss of livelihood. And it certainly would have made more sense than miracles helping single people as in the Gospels. Also, why was the suffering indiscriminate? Pagans and Christians alike suffering equally. Augustine records people being tortured for their money, women being raped, Wicked and virtuous, all being killed or robbed of their fortunes, all being equally inflicted with misfortune. Where was the sense in that? Should not the Christian God have helped his followers like he supposedly helped various martyrs and prophets in the Bible and left the pagans to their fate? It has to be remembered that all classes of people suffered. Children, pregnant women, slaves, even animals who during the siege had nothing to eat and were in fact slaughtered by the locals for food. Why did he allow this suffering? He had helped individuals before. So these were the kind of numerous ancillary questions that were also being asked and raised by the pagans, and we have to assume by Christians of that time, and which taxed Christian theologians of that period. Theologians like Augustine. By the way, if you'd like to read the book yourself, I've left a link to the book City of God in the description below the video. So let's have a look at how St. Augustine, who actually lived during that time, tries to deal with these issues of a Christian God refusing to help a Christian Rome that now worshipped him. As Augustine puts it in City of God, quote, It was my first endeavour to reply to those who attribute the wars by which the world is being devastated, and especially the recent sack of Rome by the barbarians, to the religion of Christ which prohibits the offering of abominable sacrifices to devils." By devils he is referring to the pagan Greco-Roman gods and goddesses. The book itself, The City of God, is a, a large and rambling answer to the issue compiled from 22 smaller books or chapters as as we would probably call them today and deals with a lot of other issues as well. If I tried dealing with all the issues raised in the book in one video it would take many hours so this video is going to be part of a a series of videos on Augustine in fact and his response to the pagans as written in his book. And we'll firstly deal with how Augustine thought this disaster was actually different from other disasters that had come and gone in pagan times and also what he thought of pagans and their response. And I'll go further into his criticism of pagan beliefs in future videos. A number of quick points about the City of God and Augustine's own beliefs. It has to be remembered that early Christians like Augustine really did believe the Greco-Roman gods existed, but they believed they were demons in disguise, not real divinities. And that's reflected in Augustine's own writings. So in the City of God, he does acknowledge at various points that the Roman gods performed various miracles of some sort or intervened in human affairs from time to time. However, being demons, they did this to fool humans and to mislead them from the right path and away from the true Christian God. 
And that, of course, was consistent with the Gospels, with various sundry demons and devils willy-nilly manifesting themselves into people of the first century and being driven away by Jesus and the apostles. So this belief that demons and unclean spirits, as they're termed in the Gospels, were real and did exist was uh, built into Christianity at a, a genetic level. Now, at some point, this belief was jettisoned by Christians and the pagan gods became fiction and mythology. But from the time of Christ and onwards into the 5th century and beyond, they were definitely seen as demons fooling the pagan masses who believed in them. So this was quite different from the Jews who had no belief in the Greco-Roman gods at all, believing them to be entirely fiction. Secondly, Augustine also on this issue of the fall of Rome curiously doesn't quote from the Bible or New Testament. The Bible being full of prophecies, you'd think he would utilise some obscure and vague mention of a disaster in the New or Old Testament. And certainly the fall of Rome was about as big an event as they come. But you could get the feeling he could not find anything relevant that could be utilised. So the book really covers his own views in which he tries to make sense of what has happened rather than try to extricate an answer for what happened from the Old or New Testaments. Thirdly, what's apparent as you read the book is that he seems to shed few or no tears for the fall of the city and the immense damage done to the cultural heritage of the city during the plundering. During the siege prior to the sacking, the population were put on half rations of an already small amount and which was later reduced to a third. This meant wholesale starvation and famine and even accounts of cannibalism for those that remained. The city eventually fell because, from what we know, a wealthy lady taking pity on the population had organised the opening of the, the gates of the city to allow the Goths in and put an end to the siege. Once the Goths entered the city, considerable damage was done, many of the important buildings of the city were destroyed or ransacked, including the mausoleums of Hadrian and Augustus, which were a tremendous loss for culture and history. The ashes of the former emperors were scattered around the city, and in addition, some of the important buildings and temples in the Forum were destroyed. But Augustine doesn't dwell on this disastrous economic and cultural damage done to the city. Instead, he goes pretty much straight onto the offensive against the pagans. And I suppose there is no surprise in this, as this was the raison d'etre for the book, to defend the newly Christian Rome. And so it made no sense to portray it as a major disaster, but rather a triumph of Christianity. So this disaster for the empire is given a as positive a spin as possible, and he does try to mitigate the circumstances of the disaster. So much of what happened, he says, would have happened at any other time, as that was the nature of war. Fourthly, and very curiously, he doesn't really mention that the conquerors of the city, the Goths, although Christians were not Catholic Christians, but rather Aryan Christians. And this large split between Catholics and Aryans was a big issue in those days. Aryan Christianity was seen as a heresy and had been heavily condemned at the Council of Nicaea nearly a hundred years earlier. Augustine doesn't seem to see any issue with how an army of heretics manages to destroy what was now the stronghold of Catholic Christianity. Why should a Christian god allow heretics to destroy a bastion of the true faith? Augustine doesn't try and answer this issue. Also, most, if not all, Augustine's points against paganism could really be used against any religion, and conversely, any arguments for Christianity could really be used in favour of any religion as well. For instance, he argues... Why did the Greek gods support Troy against the Greeks or let the Greeks win against them, although both sides worshipped the same deities? Or why the Roman gods allowed the Gauls to sack Rome or allowed Hannibal to have so much success against the Romans, and so on? But these arguments could be used to criticise Christianity as well. If a Christian country is attacked by another Christian country, then who should the Christian god support? Finally, Augustine does struggle with the random nature of events, and I think he realised that there is no rhyme or reason why the Christian God should push this huge misfortune on his Christian followers and a Christian empire, but he does try to make the best of it, as we shall see. So let's get straight to perhaps the most important question. Why did the Christian God allow a Christian Rome to fail? Surely that's shooting himself in the foot. You'd think God would be smiling on the Romans now the majority of the population of Rome and the empire were his followers. 
Well, Augustine, not surprisingly, doesn't really have an answer to this problem, except to justify it as some sort of trial for the people of Rome. But he's also very quick to deflect the issue and turn the question around and asks a pagan the very same question, which he says could be posed to them as well. Quote, as for those who insult over them in their trials and when ills befall them say, where is thy God? We may ask them where their gods are when they suffer the very calamities for the sake of avoiding which they worship their gods or maintain they ought to be worshipped. For the family of Christ is furnished with its reply. Our God is everywhere present, holy everywhere, not confined to any place. He can be present unperceived and be absent without moving. When he exposes us to adversities, it is either to prove our perfections or correct our imperfections. And in return for our patient endurance of the sufferings of time, he reserves for us an everlasting reward. But who are you that we should deign to speak with you even about your own gods, much less about our God, who is to be feared above all gods? For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord makes the heavens. And that effectively is his explanation for the disaster that had hit the city. But this answer that the sack of Rome was being used to, quote, prove people's perfections or correct people's imperfections, unquote, has pretty deep flaws. First of all, it doesn't really explain why many people were killed during the rampage of the Goths as they looted the city. What sort of test is this where a person, virtuous or not, pagan or Christian, is cut down by the armed Goth soldiers looking for plunder and loses his life in the process? Secondly, you could ask why the Christian God isn't asking the people of other cities to prove their perfection or improve their imperfections. Thirdly, why do people have to prove their perfections? Surely an, an omniscient God would know who was virtuous anyway. And for those who have to improve on their imperfections, why ask them to do it in such a cruel and haphazard and random fashion as starvation, rape and the destruction of their homes and livelihoods? There must be a better way than this. Lastly, Augustine forgets that the pagans themselves could use the exact same arguments. They could also claim that their gods were using the fall of the city as some sort of test both for the virtuous and the less virtuous. So his points neither validate Christianity nor invalidate paganism at all. And in fact, these same points could be used by the believers of any religion. And as for the, quote, everlasting reward, unquote, that Christians are being promised in heaven, this is entirely irrelevant to what was happening to the Romans at this time. Whether there is rewards in the Christian paradise has no bearing on why the city of Rome in particular was sacked and its people made to suffer. Augustine then asserts that what had happened during the sack of Rome was really according to the customs of war, in that the victor had the right to loot the city. But this is pretty strange coming from a, a saint, uh, as a saint he ideally should have been condemning any looting and plundering of cities and of innocent people and other atrocities that uh, invariably occur at these times. But let's get to how Augustine tries to show the suffering of the people during this time was less or certainly different than similar events during pagan times. And the way he decides to do this is to attribute the concessions that the Goths made to the Christianity that they had recently adopted. Alaric, the king of the Goths, had agreed to the basilicas of Peter and Paul to be used as sanctuaries. Anyone who reached these places was not to be harmed, although they could, of course, be relieved of all wealth and valuables even inside the churches. Quote, all the spoiling then which Rome was exposed to in the recent calamity, all the slaughter, plundering, burning and misery was the result of the custom of war. But what was novel was that savage barbarians showed themselves in so gentle a guise that the largest churches were chosen and set apart for the purpose of being filled with the people to whom quarter was given and that in them none were slain and from them none forcibly dragged that into them many were led by their relenting enemies to be set at liberty, and that from them none were led into slavery by merciless foes." Unquote. And he attributes this to the conversion of Goths to what he argues is a true religion, for if they were still pagan, they would not have shown this mercy. Quote, "'Whoever does not see that this is to be attributed to the name of Christ and to the Christian temper is blind. Whoever sees this and gives no praise is ungrateful. Whoever hinders anyone from praising it is mad. Far be it from any prudent man to impute this clemency to the barbarians. Their fierce and bloody minds were awed and bridled and marvellously tempered by him who so long before said by his prophet, I will visit this transgression with the rod and their iniquities with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from them. Unquote. Augustine argues that the Goths being Christians and allowing the use of churches as sanctuaries was something quite contrary to what were the normal practices of war 
that of killing all and sundry when a city was attacked. And rather than elaborate on the destruction and ruin of the city and the immense damage done to personal property, he deflects the attention to this mercy shown by the Goths. In regards to the looting of the city, he does try and argue that the sacking could have been a lot worse had the Christian Goths not allowed the use of churches as sanctuaries. And this, he stresses, was purely because of Christ's name, for no pagan would have allowed the use of pagan shrines as sanctuaries. It was usual in times of war to plunder temples, he says, but this only changed with the arrival of Christianity and made places of worship, places which even barbarians accepted as sacrosanct. However, the fact was that with the sudden entry of the invading army into the city, many people could not reach these places and therefore fell prey to the barbarians. And curiously, Augustine seems to show a complete absence of sorrow for the loss of human lives, property and violation of women. Simply having churches as sanctuaries may have saved some people, but not their livelihoods. And he doesn't address the issue of the many civilians who starved to death during the siege or saw their children die from malnutrition. And rather than condemning the loss of such heritage, he tries to minimise the damage done by the Goths in his attempts to show that Christian conquerors were different and milder in their disposition than previous pagan armies. Augustine then pretty confidently asserts that the pagans were never in the habit of seeing their own temples as sanctuaries in times of war. This was a new concession in times of war that had only come about due to the emergence of Christianity. Quote, there are histories of numberless wars, both before the building of Rome and since its rise and the extension of its dominion. Let these be read and let one instance be cited in which when a city had been taken by foreigners, the victors spared those who were found to have fled for sanctuary to the temples of their gods. Or one instance in which a barbarian general gave orders that none should be put to the sword who had been found in this or that temple. Well, this assertion is difficult to prove or disprove, but he does give examples of pagans violating their own temples in times of war. In fact, he gives several examples, some of them more mythical than real. One example is the fall of Troy. In Homer's classic fictionalised narrative of the war, the Iliad, Homer writes that the Greek warriors Diomedes and Ulysses desecrated the Trojan temples. The Trojans worshipped the same deities as the Greeks, so the, the Greek army was disrespecting their own gods and goddesses. Not only that, but the Greeks would raise the city to the ground, including the numerous temples. So this, Augustine argued, was quite different to how the Goths were treating the churches in Rome during the conquest of the city. Secondly, during the looting of Troy, the Greeks had abused the temple of Minerva, killing its guards and using the temple complex to store the loot from the city before it was taken away. The goddess Minerva, Augustine said, had done nothing in exchange for this insult to her temple and the, the Greeks had successfully spirited away their plunder and reached home successfully. And this showed how impotent the Greek deities were. Instead of destroying the Greeks, they had helped them reach home safely with the plunder they had taken from Minerva's temple. Again, in contrast, the Christian gods had not used churches in this fashion. And in his other examples, he also includes Julius Caesar mentioning the destruction of temples as something to be expected in times of war. The Christian gods had not extended this concession of sanctuary to the pagan temples. And the next major point he makes is that the pagans showed cowardice in fleeing to the churches to escape the gods rather than taking refuge in their own pagan temples. Many, he says, pretended to be Christians when they entered the churches so that the Goths wouldn't kill them. In other words, lying to save their lives. And he mocks them for criticising Christianity when it was safe to come out and the Goths had left the city and attributing their lives to pure good luck. Quote, Meanwhile, I will briefly and to the best of my ability explain what I meant to say about these ungrateful men who blasphemously impute to Christ the calamities which they deservedly suffer in consequence of their own wicked ways. While that which is for Christ's sake spared them in spite of their wickedness, they do not even take the trouble to notice. And in their mad and blasphemous insolence, they use against his name those very lips wherewith they falsely claimed that same name that their lives might be spared. In the places consecrated to Christ, where for his sake no enemy would injure them, they restrain their tongues that they might be safe and protected. But no sooner do they emerge from these sanctuaries than they unbridle their tongues to hurl against him curses full of hate. But his more interesting words are his warning to them of even more grievous punishment to come for their unbelief and for saving their lives when they fled to the churches. Quote, Therefore ought they to give God thanks and with sincere confession flee for refuge to his name, that so they may escape the punishment of eternal fire. They who with lying lips took upon them this name, that they might escape the punishment of present destruction. 
For of those whom you see insolently and shamelessly insulting the servants of Christ, they are numbers who would not have escaped that destruction and slaughter had they not pretended that they themselves were Christ's servants. Yet now in ungrateful pride and most impious madness and at the risk of being punished in everlasting darkness, they perversely oppose that name under which they fraudulently protected themselves for the sake of enjoying the light of this brief life." Unquote. So there's none of that generosity and welcome that should have been there, that lives had been saved, whether Christian or not. Instead, he castigates them for what he sees as subterfuge by the pagans. So finally, back to the vexing issue of why some people died and some survived in the fall of the city. More specifically, the problem of why pagans in particular survived. Augustine's rather simplistic point of view, as before, is that it, it is simply a test to see if the pagans would see the error of their ways and change from unbelief and convert to Christianity. Quote, and that you are yet alive is due to God who spares you, that you may be admonished to repent and reform your lives. It is he who has permitted you, ungrateful as you are, to escape the sword of the enemy by calling yourself his servants or by finding asylum in the sacred places of the martyrs." Unquote. So in this video, I haven't tried to cover the full implications of what Augustine says in City of God, as this would have made the video far too long. But hopefully this video has been a good introduction into Augustine's stance on the sack of Rome, the plight of the people, uh, his views on those seemingly arbitrarily killed and those who arbitrarily survived as well, and the attempt to see some sort of positive aspect in terms of Christianity for the fall of the city. And I'll be diving deeper into his work in part two of this video and on the many other issues arising from, the, from Christian Rome's decline and the fall to the gods. And that includes his views on slavery. You have to remember many Romans were taken as slaves by the gods. And also the commandment, thou shalt not kill, which seems to run counter to the self-defense of the defenders of Rome and how he sees this commandment in light of the, the war against the barbarians. And finally, if you'd like to read City of God yourself, I've left a, a link in the description below this video. And I hope to see you again for part two of this series on Augustine. A reminder, if you do like these kind of videos, do please give the channel a subscribe and a like for the video as well.